Police are searching for two suspects after a man is shot in a Scarborough high rise. The male victim prior to police arrival was actually uh, being assisted by residents of the building. The victim in life threatening condition tonight as officers canvass the building for witnesses and surveillance video. Plus, simply calling it a crisis doesn't change the conditions. Toronto City Council rejects the idea of opening 24 7 warming centers, voting against declaring homelessness a public health crisis. And everything I own in here is now just being covered. <laughs> oh my god, sorry, I actually don't yeah. think I can stay in here. This tenant is calling for more accountability from his landlord after a dead raccoon is found rotting in his ceiling. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. A man is in hospital with life-threatening injuries tonight after being shot in the stairwell of a Scarborough apartment building. Police are still searching for the suspects at this hour. Two men who they say had an interaction with the victim right before he was shot. Dale Manukduk has the latest. Shortly after 5 p.m., Toronto police received a call for a shooting incident that occurred at this high-rise residential building along Pharmacy Avenue. 41 division officers responded to the scene and located a 22-year-old man suffering from what appeared to be gunshot wounds. Police had originally said he was shot in the leg, but now say his injuries were to his lower body and that he is in life-threatening condition. The male victim prior to police arrival was actually uh, being assisted by residents of the building who were attempting to uh, treat his injuries. <laughs> and uh, Toronto Paramedic Services arrived on scene um, and stabilized the, the victim and subsequently transported him to a uh, area trauma center where uh, he is uh, now uh, being treated. We don't know the motive of this shooting or whether it was targeted. We do know that according to police, it happened in one of the stairwells of this apartment building. Police say that given the size of the building, it will take several hours for the forensics unit to canvas and gather evidence. As for the suspects, it is early in the investigation. It's a little early to say exactly uh, how the suspects fled, but we, we are confident that the threat to public safety um, it no longer exists and the, the best description that we can provide is that uh, we do believe that there are uh, two male suspects that are outstanding. Police have not recovered any weapons but again they are canvassing and speaking to witnesses. They are asking that anyone with any information or video surveillance contact them. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. A man is in hospital tonight after being struck by a car in a hit and run. It happened around 2 this morning on Burnham Thorpe near Mill Road. The victim is a man in his 20s. He was taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. A police say the driver of the vehicle failed to remain at the scene but was located later by officers. 34-year-old Dustin Yu of Toronto has been charged with leaving the scene of an accident causing bodily harm. And we're learning more details tonight surrounding the deaths of a couple in Bowmanville. Homicide detectives are investigating after the bodies of a man and a pregnant woman were found inside a home over the weekend. Greg Ross has more. According to Durham Regional Police, the man and woman found dead in this home on Saturday afternoon were a married couple. The victims are 26-year-old Rafad Al-Zubaydi and 28-year-old Aram Kamal. We have determined that the cause of death was from gunshot wounds. Police have now confirmed that Al Zubaydi was pregnant. Their bodies were discovered at about 2.15 on Saturday afternoon. Officers received a call from uh, a concerned person who wanted us to check on the well-being of the two residents. At this point, it's not clear who shot the couple or why they were killed. A number of homes in this neighborhood have security cameras with a clear shot of this house where the couple lived. Now, many of the residents here weren't comfortable talking to me on camera, but several of them did tell me that at about 1 o'clock on Saturday morning, their security cameras captured three people wearing masks and entering this home through a side door. Several minutes later, those people were seen running from the home and then speeding off in a car. Police are now reviewing those videos. Right now, uh, investigators sorry, are going through video, speaking with witnesses uh, in the area uh, to put a timeline together to determine exactly what's happened. Police are asking anyone with information or video to come forward. Greg Ross, CBC News, Bowmanville. 
Toronto City Council has rejected the idea of keeping the city's warming centers open 24-7 until April. Council had been considering the idea ever since the city's Board of Health put forth the recommendation last month. But today, councillors voting against the motion, instead agreeing the city should push other levels of government for more funding for shelters. Alicia Sant has the latest. Review of extreme weather supports for homeless. The morning starts with a motion to scrap the Board of Health recommendation to declare homelessness a crisis. Simply calling it a crisis doesn't change the conditions. Since it's not just a Toronto issue, Councillor Michael Thompson suggests the city ask the province and the feds to pay more to help. What we need are the resources to add to the mayor's objective, which is to provide more shelter, more housing, and more support. Councillor Thompson says in the meantime, the current system is sufficient, where winter respite sites only open on the coldest days as needed. Councillor Josh Matlow counters that. Given that we currently, right now, right today, have people on our streets, in our parks, in our lanes, would you not agree that we should move now to ensure that they do have safe places to go that are predictable through the winter months. Motion to carries the vote is 15 to 11. Councillor Thompson's motion not to declare homelessness a crisis won. The idea of 24 seven warming centers and uh, you know, getting people into shelter is, is, a, is a good one. We have the ability now with respect to our systems that are in place to respond, to suggest that the tools are not there uh, in terms of responding to the need, it's not correct. This uh, council did not declare the crisis that we can plainly see that from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, emergency room doctors, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, tens of thousands of residents have told us that they're seeing and experiencing and they want us to act. That's what this council did today. They ignored that. Where opposing councillors were miffed, outreach workers are... I mean... I'm not surprised, but I am very disappointed and I'm pretty angry. And it feels like um, the lives of vulnerable people are not prioritized. The city estimated it would cost around $400,000 a month to run a warming centre round the clock. As Lorraine Lamb points out, it costs $1.7 million a month for a recent initiative to get the cops to patrol the TTC. The money is there. Um, it's just the way that the city is allocating it, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Advocates like Lorraine Lamb are invited to participate in a roundtable discussion about the need for 24-hour winter warming sites for an upcoming report in the springtime. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Also on the agenda today, bike lanes on Yonge Street. Councillors voting yes to making them permanent between Bloor and Davisville. The lanes were installed as a pilot project in 2021 and they've been controversial. Cyclists and their advocates say the lanes make for a safer ride. But some people living in the area and drivers say with traffic lanes reduced on such a busy part of Yonge Street, it's creating a safety hazard. Council voted 22 to 3 in favour of the lanes. Meteorologist Nick Cernkovich joining us now with a first look at the forecast. And Nick, always nice to see some sun, which we did earlier today, and temperatures again mild. Yeah, I think a lot of people soaking up the sun today, Caldo. We've had temperatures up to 7 degrees, and it did come with a lot of sunshine as well. Here's a look at how the day played out in terms of temperatures. Last night, uh, just above the zero mark, remained that way through the overnight. This morning, 3 degrees by the afternoon plus seven and sunshine. Now, with that being said, we're watching a system that's moving into the GTA, and this is changing things a little bit, at least in terms of the sunshine. Uh, this guy is going to push across the GTA by tomorrow morning. The risk for a little bit of patchy freezing rain on the leading edge of it and some very strong winds as well. Then rain heavy at times through the day tomorrow before it begins to taper off and somewhat cooler temperatures and very windy conditions moving in behind it as we move through Friday and into Saturday. Here's a look at the next 24 minus one tonight. The risk for a little bit of early morning freezing rain, eight degrees tomorrow, 15 to 25 millimeters of rain and some windy conditions. There are special weather statements in effect and some warnings as well. We'll talk to you about that coming up in just a bit. Thanks so much, Nick. We're hearing from Premier Doug Ford and his health minister tonight on the promise of billions of dollars in federal funding for health care. As Lorena Redicott reports, there is concern about the timeline for the cash and whether some areas of health care system are getting enough. I'm 
and confident. We'll, we'll, you know, get the T's crossed, the I's dotted. Premier Doug Ford back at Queen's Park after yesterday's meeting in Ottawa. He says he expects a deal will come with the federal government adding an extra $46 billion in health care funding over 10 years. We want sustainability. We need certainty uh, moving forward, not just for a few years, five or 10 years, but decades to come. Ontario's health minister at an announcement at a hospice says that longer term funding is important for projects such as adding more medical schools. She also pointed to one area where she expected more. Well, frankly, I was a little surprised that there wasn't more focus on community care and home care. Um, to me, it is a very natural place for that patient experience to be improved. All right, so just relax for me. These talks are happening as roughly 2 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. The Ontario Medical Association wants internationally trained physicians already here to be licensed as one shorter term solution and digital health care improved. We know that if all the doctors in Ontario could save one hour per day of paperwork. We could see about a million more patients a month. Speaking on Metro Morning, former federal health minister Jane Philpott called yesterday's announcement underwhelming. The premiers and the prime minister could have said together, we are going to enter Medicare 2.0. She hoped to see things like wait times addressed, ensuring everyone has a family doctor, and a larger overall vision for health care. As for the talks that are still to come between the province and the federal government? I hope it's about things like training more nurses, training more family doctors. I hope it's about things like improving our wait times. Uh, we'd like to know that those conversations are visionary and not simply about dollars and cents. The next talks will take place tomorrow here in Toronto. Health Minister Jones and Premier Ford will meet with the Federal Minister of Health as well as the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Long wait times have been a major concern in Canada's health care system for years. One proposed solution that's getting a lot of attention lately is private clinics. But it's not a new idea. As Mike Crawley explains, a loophole in the Canada Health Act already allows patients to move to the private system if they foot the bill. Before he got a hip replacement, Mike Johansson found just about any activity brutally painful. About 70, 80 percent of the time was laying in bed. That was the only way that there really wasn't a whole lot of pain. It took Johansson six months to get a consultation with the surgeon. Then I was told from that point onwards it was an 18 to 24 month wait. The prospect of waiting that long in that much pain sent him looking for options. I had no idea what kind of what kind of condition or anything I'd be like after another 18 months of doing it. Nearly 140,000 people get a hip or knee replacement each year in Canadian hospitals. Wait times vary widely, but six months is considered standard. Private surgical clinics around the country are advertising to patients that they can avoid those waits and get joint replacements done in just a few weeks if they pay. Mike Johansson spent more than $23,000 for his surgery. Best investment I've ever made. I don't look at myself as a, as a person who, who jumped to the front of the queue. I got out of the queue. Yes. <laughs> There's some evidence that paying to get surgeries done more quickly is a growing trend. Johansson came to this private clinic in a suburb of Montreal, where doctors only do joint replacements and only for paying patients. Well, our volume at the clinic increased significantly in the last uh, uh, two years. There are more and more patients uh, willing to pay for their, the, their hip or knee replacement. The Canada Health Act generally prohibits doctors from charging for medically necessary surgeries, but there are exceptions, including doctors can charge a patient who has opted to travel from another province. This surgeon says more people paying privately won't solve the wait times problem. What that does is it increases wait times for the rest of the people who are still in the public system because of the loss of resources from that public system into the private system. Dr. Urbach says governments could shorten wait lists by putting more money into the system. Consider this operating room sitting idle on a weekday morning. It could be used if the hospital had funding, if this hospital had uh, staffing. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. 
Welcome back. One of the city's steepest hills is a safety hazard for residents in the Jane and Dundas area. It's called St. Mark's Hill. In winter, it's a slippery obstacle course for everyone who uses it, drivers, cyclists and pedestrians. Safety advocates say they've been pushing for solutions. When we got organized a year ago, after that six car pile up on the sidewalk, what we realized were there was a number of structural issues with the hill and there was also maintenance issues. So immediately we've been asking for short term temporary barriers to be placed to provide protection for pedestrians. After temporary barriers, we're looking at a long term complete street solution that includes pedestrian, cyclists and vehicle measures. For residents of the Warren Park community, there is no other way out of their neighborhood to access public transit, shops, even schools. The local councillor says the city is working to help make the hill safer for everyone. I've directed city staff to go and look at whether we should reconstruct the road, uh, what design options are available to us. Uh, that was just passed at community council a few weeks ago and I'm hoping we'll see that report soon. In the meantime, the local residents association has launched a design contest for students asking the kids to provide their solutions. A Toronto man says his apartment has become unlivable due to a raccoon infestation. He says one of the raccoons is rotting in his ceiling, causing a terrible smell. The ordeal has prompted a public health investigation, but as Talia Ricci reports, the tenant says it's been a struggle to get help from his landlord. I have to stay somewhere else because we paid a very short visit to Jordan Tessier's apartment today. This is my unit here. Just be ready for smell. Oof. Oh my God. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. See, and it just keeps getting worse every day. Yeah. And everything I own in here is now just being covered. <laughs> oh my God. Sorry. I actually don't yeah. think I can stay in here. We're going to chat in here, but yeah. truly the smell is like so bad that we're not going to chat in here. We're okay. going to go outside. Perfect. Okay. I was in Ottawa for about a week and a half taking care of my brother during his chemo treatments. And uh, I came home Saturday night and I noticed that my entire apartment smelled like rotting flesh and I had no idea where it was coming from. I honestly thought that my neighbor upstairs had passed away. So the raccoon... Uh, Tessier says he couldn't get a hold of his property manager until Monday. On Tuesday, an exterminator came by for an assessment. He did say that he wasn't able to go into my apartment without wearing a gas mask. He said that it's way too uh, potent of a smell for it to be like a dead mouse or rat, that it has to be something bigger like a raccoon. Tessier says it's not the first time the building has had issues with raccoons, but because he isn't currently able to live in his unit, he's calling for more accountability from the property manager. I need compensation for everything in my apartment that's ruined and, you know, having to go stay somewhere else. Like if I didn't have family here, I would be homeless. Initially, Royal York Property Management provided a statement saying it was taking the necessary steps to resolve the issue. CBC Toronto then asked how long this process would take and whether the tenant would receive any compensation. Late today, the company said the tenant would be receiving compensation and that construction would begin tonight. The landlord has a duty to keep it fit for habitation. That's the law. This lawyer says the in these situations, it's important that everything is documented. So that if it does get before a board at some point, you have your evidence and you have your story. That's really how you'll be awarded some form of damages or compensation. Tessier says the tenants have been keeping each other updated in a group chat. He says at this time, he has no idea when his unit will be livable again. I can't even put into words how this is completely turned my world upside down. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. A book of condolences has been set up at Queen's Park for Hazel McCallion. Premier Doug Ford was among the first today to pay his respects. I wrote a, a nice little note for Hazel in there. We're going to miss her. And uh, she was a true, true mentor and uh, a friend. And I'm sure uh, thousands of people could say the exact same thing that I'm saying right now. For signing the book at Queen's Park this morning, joining him was Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell. The former Mississauga Mayor Hazel McCallion died late last month at the age of 101. Members of the public can sign the book of condolences at Queen's Park until Monday. Let's go back to Nick now with a look at your extended forecast. And Nick, pretty much rain all day tomorrow. 
Yeah, pretty stormy weather for tomorrow. Uh, we've got some special weather statements in effect, also some warnings as well. Now, I mentioned the freezing rain earlier on. Freezing rain warnings to the north of the GTA and also a little bit toward the west end as well. Uh, this for sort of the early morning hours. And then as the system passes, some very gusty winds, and we've got wind warnings in effect along the north shores of uh, Lake Erie. So very breezy conditions for everybody else. Special weather statements uh, remain in effect here with this system. And that, again, not quite meeting the warning criteria, but about 15 to 25 millimeters of rain and gusty winds, as mentioned. Let's time it out for you. So starting tonight down in southwestern Ontario, early morning hours tomorrow, just uh, poking into the golden horseshoe there. The risk on the leading edge of this, of some freezing rain before it transitions over to rainfall. Heavy at times across the GTA, begins to taper to showers as we head into the afternoon. And then windy conditions build in behind this system for uh, tomorrow night into Friday morning. And after that, we're just looking at a few snow flurries and some light snow squalls to develop as we move through Friday afternoon. That's as the cold air colder air moves in. Uh, rainfall accumulations generally in the 20 millimeter range could be a little bit more for some areas. That's what it looks like across southern Ontario. And winds, as we move through tomorrow morning, we're looking at easterly winds at about 20 or 30 kilometers per hour. As the system passes, though, the winds shift to the southwest, and we're expecting to see some very strong winds for City of Toronto, likely around that 70 kilometer per hour mark, but areas along the north shores of Lake Erie uh, could very well see wind gusts 80, even 90 kilometers kilometers per hour. So that's one to watch. Slowly begins to taper off though as we head through Friday morning. For tonight, temperatures down to about minus one, minus two degrees across the region. Tomorrow, we're looking at uh, daytime highs that'll sit at eight degrees with that rain and uh, windy conditions. A few light flurries on Friday at three degrees and we remain above the zero mark right through until next Monday. Kelda. Thanks so much, Nick. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you can get caught up anytime. Just head to cbc.ca slash Toronto. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.